Good, well, a warm welcome to uh, the service this evening. Um, I'm David Lewis from Clashley Free Evangelical Church and Daylight Christian Prison Trust. Christian Prison Trust, yeah. I should know the name, I just call it Daylight. Um, in the absence of everyone else who seems to be away this evening, uh, I'm going to lead the service. So uh, we're going to um, sing to open uh, a great hymn of praise, um, which is, O Thou Who Came Us From Above, The Pure Celestial Fire to Impart. So we'll sing to God's praise together. Notices are Sunday morning, 10.30, you've got David Williams. I can remember David being born, so there you go. <laughs> and I used to see him actually in parents' evening because he's the same age as one of my daughters. So uh, you've got David on Sunday, so I'm sure that'll be a good day. David's currently assistant pastor in Malpas Road in Newport, so uh, I'm sure you'll have a, a good day with him. Uh, good, we're continuing our um, looking at uh, the book of Leviticus. Uh, I'll pray and then uh, we're going to read Leviticus chapter 6. So let's uh, commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that uh, we can meet together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Thank you that we have the freedom and the ability to be able to meet together like this. We thank you that we take none of these things for granted. And we pray now that we would know something of the presence of your Holy Spirit with us, that as we look to your word, you would uh, help us to understand it by your spirit and also as well father that you would apply it to our hearts that you would warm our hearts as we consider how all these uh, truths and uh, rituals apply to the lord jesus christ and therefore apply to us today and so father we pray that you would grant us by your spirit to understand your word but also that we would be uh, our hearts warmed within us as we think of what a glorious saviour you have given to us in Jesus Christ. So, Father, as we read now and hear from your word, speak to us, we pray, and we ask these things now in the glorious name of our great saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So the reading is Leviticus chapter 6. Um, it's quite um, a fairly long reading, 30 verses. So I'll read it at a bit of pace, and, um, yeah, and uh, that will take us through it then. Uh, so it's Leviticus chapter 6 and uh, verse 1. 
The Lord said to Moses, If anyone sins and is unfaithful to the Lord by deceiving a neighbour about something entrusted to them, or left in their care, or about something stolen, or if they cheat their neighbour, or if they find lost property and lie about it, or if they swear falsely about any such sin that people may commit, when they sin in any of these ways and realise their guilt, they must return what they have stolen or taken by extortion or what was entrusted to them, or the lost property they found, or whatever it was they swore falsely about. They must make restitution in full, add a fifth of the value to it, and give it all to the owner on the day they present their guilt offering. And as a penalty, they must bring to the priest, that is to the Lord, their guilt offering, a ram from the flock, one without defect of the proper value. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them before the Lord, and they will be forgiven for any of the things they did that made them guilty. The Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons this command. Uh, These are the regulations for the burnt offering. The burnt offering is to remain on the altar, hearth, throughout the night, till morning, and the fire must be kept burning on the altar. The priest shall then put on his linen clothes, with linen undergarments next to his body, and shall remove the ashes of the burnt offering that the fire has consumed on the altar and place them beside the altar. Then he is to take off these clothes and put on others and carry the ashes outside the camp to a place that is ceremonially clean. The fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offerings on it. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. These are the regulations for the grain offering. Aaron's sons are to bring it before the Lord in front of the altar. The priest is to take a handful of the finest flour and some olive oil, together with all the incense on the grain offering, and burn the memorial portion on the altar as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Aaron and his sons shall eat the rest of it, but it is to be eaten without yeast in the sanctuary area. They are to eat it in the courtyard of the tent of meeting. It must not be baked with yeast. I have given it as their share of the food offerings presented to me. Like the sin offering and the guilt offering, it is most holy. Any male descendant of Aaron may eat it. For all generations to come, it is his perpetual share of the food offerings presented to the Lord. Whatever touches it will become holy. The Lord also said to Moses, this is the offering Aaron and his sons are to bring to the Lord on the day he is anointed, a tenth of an ephah of the finest flour as a regular grain offering, half of it in the morning and half in the evening. It must be prepared with oil on a griddle. Bring it well mixed and present the grain offering broken in pieces as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. The son who is to succeed him as anointed priest shall prepare it. It is the Lord's perpetual share and is to be burnt completely. Every grain offering of a priest shall be burnt completely. It must not be eaten. The Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron and his sons, these are the regulations for the sin offering. The sin offering is to be slaughtered before the Lord in the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered. It is most holy. The priest who offers it shall eat it. It is to be eaten in the sanctuary area, in the courtyard of the tent of meeting. Whatever touches any of the flesh will become holy. And if any of the blood is splattered uh, on a garment, you must wash it in the sanctuary area. The clay pot that the meat is cooked in must be broken. But if it is cooked in a bronze pot, the pot is to be scoured and rinsed with water. Any male in a priest's family may eat it. It is most holy. But any sin offering whose blood is brought into the tent of meeting to make atonement in the holy place must not be eaten. It must be burnt. Leviticus chapter 6. A lot of regulations, aren't there? In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets in Matthew 5.17. I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And so when we come to a passage like this, which is law and prophets, but it's law in particular here, 
Jesus fulfills these things. He doesn't abolish them. He is the fulfillment of them. There's a huge difference, isn't there, between abolishing something and fulfilling it. We see it in nature all the time. Um, in fact, I've seen quite a few caterpillars in the last few weeks. Just suddenly came to mind. But I really have. don't know why. It's obviously the time of year. Lots of caterpillars. And... Um, and of course, you can study a caterpillar, and they kind of some of them are very really pretty to look at and colourful, and but they eat your veg, especially if you grow lettuces or cabbages, so they're a bit of a pain. But they are functional. You know, you can learn about all kinds of things from a caterpillar. But you know, don't you, that there's a time coming when that caterpillar is going not to be abolished, but to be fulfilled. Uh, that caterpillar that eats your garden is going to change into something that actually is going to help pollinate your garden. It's changed into something that has real beauty as a butterfly. The butterfly, we could say, is fulfilled. It's a fulfilled caterpillar. The caterpillar existed. It's functional. It's alive. It's doing everything that caterpillars do, eating and eating. I guess that's all they do, isn't they? I don't know if they sleep. Um, but that's what caterpillars do. But now they're fulfilled. They become something that fly and soar and actually are beautiful and wondrous. And when we look at the book of Leviticus, we are seeing things here that aren't abolished, but they, of course, have gone because they've been fulfilled by the Lord Jesus. And so when we come to look at a book like Leviticus, we see straight away that it's, it's not irrelevant to us. It's worth looking, if you like, at the caterpillar, because looking at the caterpillar, you learn more about what the butterfly is going to be like and what the butterfly is like. And we are seeing, of course, here that the Lord Jesus fulfills those things that we have read of even this evening. We have seen, uh, particularly last week, we were looking and we just kind of recapped where we were. The Israelites have been saved by God out of Israel. If you remember in Israel, one of the things that Moses used to say to Pharaoh was, let my people go that they may worship me. They were being saved to worship God. How, as we saw last week, can the Israelites worship God? How can the Israelites, who are sinners like us, how can they have God living in their presence? How can they commune with him? And that's the issue, which is why we have the book of Leviticus because the whole of Leviticus really is God's instructions to Moses so that we move from where we were in verse 1 which is Moses speaking to God from outside the tent of meeting and then we get to Numbers 1 verse 1 where we get Moses talking and meeting with God inside the tent of meeting it's all because of what happens here and uh, a unique God lives with the people. Um, God here is showing his grace. This is, although it doesn't seem it with all the, the, the rituals that we read of, and these are just one chapter in seven chapters, and although there are great details here, we see the grace of God here. God is allowing sinners to be in his presence. God is living with sinners. And so it is grace, really, here that we see. Um, I put a, a slide up last week where we saw the kind of the mirror structure of uh, the book of Leviticus. It starts with uh, rituals, chapters 1 to 7 of the sacrifices. And at the end, the rituals, chapters 22 to 25 of the feasts. And then you move in a bit and uh, you get... Uh, something else that I now can't remember, uh, but it doesn't matter, we'll come back because we're looking at that next week. And then in the centre, you get the Day of Atonement. So chapters uh, 15 and 16, I think they are, are the Days of Atonement, and, uh, and everything else kind of branches out almost from them. You kind of move into the middle and move back out again. And so ritual is the first thing that we're really looking at as we look at the book of Leviticus. And in the first seven verses, there are sacrifices, uh, first seven chapters, rather, the ritual is sacrifices, and then in chapters 22 to 25, those four chapters are all about the feasts or the festivals, same thing. 
And so sacrifice and sacrificial offerings are there to say thank you. And they are there to say sorry. So we're going to have a look at those in a moment. So the grain and fellowship offerings that we read of are there to say to God thank you. And then the, the burnt offering, the purification offering, the restitution, all those offerings are there uh, for basically the people to be forgiven. The people are basically saying, sorry to God, I've done this wrong. And then there are seven annual feasts as well, which are mentioned, chapters 22 to five, 25. Generally, they look back uh, as to, and to remind the people how God graciously saved them. Uh, of course, they're fulfilled for us, the feasts. But we look back, don't we? When we take the Lord's Supper, communion, we are looking back to what Jesus has done. They have seven feasts to look back to what God has done generally in the Exodus. So, let's have a look at the sacrifices first. Uh, and so the first thing is, what difference do the sacrifices make? Why is God telling Moses to make all these different sacrifices? Well, because remember, Moses is outside the tent of meeting. Because God is a holy God, Moses cannot go into the tent at this time. Sacrifice has to be made so that a sinner like Moses, as great as he is, can go into the presence of the living God. And the ritual sacrifices really are split into two, as I mentioned, grain and peace or fellowship. Those offerings were offered to God to say sorry, uh, sorry, to say thank you to him. Uh, and it really is an act of worship. I was struck yesterday, um, I was doing some work on something else, and, and struck really on um, the passage in Luke's Gospel where Jesus is walking uh, along the road and the, the disciples have just asked about an increase in faith, which is interesting. And the next story is about the ten lepers that Jesus heals. So they're talking about an increase in faith, and uh, everything in the Bible is ordered in a particular way, isn't it? And uh, the context is, Lord, increase our faith. And the next thing, there are these lepers. Ten of them, they're healed. And uh, Jesus gives them clear instructions. Go to the temple, you know, or, uh, show yourself to the priest. One of them, of course, returns to say thank you. Ten were obedient. They're doing what Jesus told them to do. But one of them is worshipping context is all about increasing faith which is interesting when that comes right next to it uh, in uh, Luke's gospel what are we seeing there we're seeing one worshiping God and this is what we're seeing here these offerings are the worship of God it is the people of God saying thank you to him that is what worship is isn't it so often we fail to thank God for all that he has done and all that he is but of course, there's also other sacrifices as well. The burnt offering, the purification offering, the restitution sacrifices, offered to God to say sorry for different sins. And uh, the animal in them all was killed. The animal died symbolically in the place of this sinner and atonement was made. At one was made. God and sinner united because of the sacrifice. They are at one. And chapters 1 to 7 really spell it out for the Israelites. God is giving all these seven chapters worth of instructions to Moses. Chapter 1 is all about burnt offerings. Chapter 2 is grain offerings. Chapter 3 is peace or fellowship offerings. Chapter 4 is sin offerings. Chapter 5 is sins of omission, so things that you fail to do. Not, so not something you've deliberately done, but something you fail to do. And then chapter 6, as we read, and chapter 7 are instructions for the priests. This is what the priests are to do. This is how, in other words, you administer the ritual sacrifices. This is what you do. So imagine for a moment, take yourself now into the wilderness. You're on your way to the promised land. You're trying to worship God. You know that the holy God is living in the midst of the camp. And you sin intentionally or unintentionally. And so what do you do? Well, a ritual sacrifice has to be made now for your sin. Your sin needs to be dealt with, atoned for. 
You cannot be in the presence of a holy God. And we see what happens to some of the people, as we mentioned last week, is that some of the priests go in and they are killed, they are consumed by God. But in the grace of God, God has given you instruction through Moses as to what to do. So you have a look at your particular sin, what you've done wrong, and you see, right, what animal or what sacrifice needs to be made. And so you get the particular animal. It can't be a wild animal. It's got to be your animal because there's got to be a cost to you. So you can't go out and kind of just find anything. It's got to be your animal. And you then kill your animal and the priests throw the blood against the altar. That's what they do. The priests bring the dead animal to God. And it, it's a symbol, really, of the consecration of the worshipper to God's service. The lifeblood of the animal symbolizes death. The blood ceremonially cleans the altar. And it is a graphic picture, isn't it? But we've got to say as well, it is incredibly messy. I mean, there's blood everywhere because as you're bringing your animal sacrifice and the blood is being so is everyone else you're not on your own you know there's a vast multitude of the israelites who are all sinning by commission or omission and they've got to bring their animal and it's going to be killed and there's going to be blood thrown on the altar it is i mean it's it's fairly horrid if you're a vegetarian or a vegan or something like that, it's not something to be looked at, is it? But there you are. But that's what it's like. It's messy and it's bloody. But we also see the grace of God here, again. Because if you're poor, then provision is made for you. You don't have to provide, you know, a great, huge, expensive bull. The cheapest option is a pigeon. And there's kind of a variety of animals in between. And the general rule is, is the poor that will be looked after. And that's one of the themes of the ritual feasts that we'll look about uh, to, uh, in, a, uh, in a few moments. The other general theme in this se these seven chapters is this. The worse the sin, the greater the sacrifice. So if the sin has been committed, for example, by the nation, which happened from time to time, of course, or by a priest, then chapter 4 tells us that a bull needs to be offered to God. So the greater the sin, the greater the sacrifice. Bull being the kind of the most expensive because because it's a bull and because of what a bull does. Um, and so bulls are valued the most and they are the biggest sacrifice. So that a nation and a priest are both bulls. It reminds us actually the importance of the priest and the holiness of a priest because their sin needs forgiveness their lives need to be atoned for and so you see grace and justice running together here god is just his justice must be done but in grace god provides doesn't he substitutes in the form of animals to take away the sin of the people who have committed them so the grace of god living in the midst of this people he is willing to accept these ritual sacrifices God doesn't have to. God doesn't live with any other nation. He lives with the Israelites, but he is willing to for their sake. So that's the difference, really, that the ritual sacrifices made to the Israelites. That's what they did. Second thing is, though, there are more rituals because there are ritual feasts as well. Those four chapters, 23, 24, 25, that's three chapters I can't count. I said four early as well. And as I was looking at the numbers, I was thinking, is that three or four? It's three chapters, 23, 24, 25. And uh, in those three chapters, there are seven ritual feasts or festivals to remind the children of God how they've been saved, redeemed from Egypt. They're all about who the Israelites were and who God was to them. And uh, uh, a reminder in the feast basically is a covenant reminder the basis of God's covenants I am your God you are my people and the covenant promises are basically fulfilling that God is God and he is our God and we are his it's that kind of union together covenanted promised 
like a marriage covenant. Uh, we don't tend to call them marriage covenants today, but years ago they did. Two people being brought together. He is hers, she is his, together. And that's the covenant between God and his people. And these are a reminder, these feasts, festivals, are a reminder uh, to the people. Food plays a huge part in the Bible. It really does. Somebody bought me a book a couple of years ago about just New Testament things, basically food with Jesus, which is just remarkable. And when you see it kind of all laid out, the time, it is, food is huge in the Bible. Anyway, um, seven feasts, here they are. Uh, more of them well known to us than others. The Passover, well known to us, where the people of Israel remembered the last plague, last of the ten plagues when they were in Egypt. God saved the Israelites. The blood of the spotless lamb on the doorposts. Who's inside the house? The lamb, uh, the angel is not looking at who's inside, not looking at how deep their faith is, not looking at how faithful they've been for years. All he's looking for, are they covered by the blood? That's all the angels are looking for. Is the blood on the doorposts? Are they covered by the blood? So they remember the Passover. That's the first of the feasts, festivals. This is the festival of unleavened bread. No time to add yeast to the bread when leaving Egypt. You know, they were dressed ready to leave. And there was no yeast, just cut flat bread, basically. Uh, and so the unleavened bread, or the first fruits, three days or on the third day after the Passover, people gave thanks to God for his provision. So it's on the third day after the blood of the Passover. We'll come back to that. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, then we've got the weeks, festival of weeks, or Pentecost, as we would know it. Seven weeks after the first fruits, they celebrate the harvest. That's what Pentecost basically was, the harvest. Again, we'll have a look at that. There's the festival of trumpets, which was a command to rest, a time to worship God as we rest. Then there's, of course, the Day of Atonement. We'll look at this in more detail in a few weeks' time. But once a year, the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, and he goes in behalf of all God's people with a sacrifice for the, for the nation, for all God's people. And then the seventh one, seventh one is the festival or the feast of the booths or the festival of tabernacles, which is celebrating the truth that God is with his people. He's in the midst of them. Now, they are lovely feasts, and you can spend and do a lot of good by looking at the individual feasts. But Jesus fulfills them all, remember. And these are the caterpillar, and Jesus really is the most beautiful butterfly. So, what difference do the rituals make? What dif or sacrifices? What difference do the feasts make? Third thing, what difference does Jesus make? Because we don't celebrate those festivals we don't make those sacrifices anymore because Jesus doesn't destroy them, but he does fulfill them. And because they're fulfilled, we don't use them anymore. But he has fulfilled them. So let's look at the feast that we've just looked at first. I mean, the Passover. Jesus is the, with a capital T, probably even a capital H-E as well, the Passover lamb, isn't he? He is the lamb of God. What does John say uh, in John chapter 1? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, not just the Israelites in Egypt. He is the great Passover Lamb. He fulfills that feast. The, power, the uh, feast of the unleavened bread, John 6, 35. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He fulfills it because he gives bread which satisfies. That's the point. It satisfies forever, eternally. Bread satisfies for a little while. I've rediscovered bread during lockdown the last 70 months. It's not great, is it? But I've eaten more bread in this time than I think I have for years. But bread doesn't satisfy for long, does it? But Jesus does because he's the bread of life. First fruits. Festival of the first, first fruits was on the third day. The third day uh, after Passover, and the blood is shed. Well, it's the resurrection of Jesus that that's pointing forward to. He is the first fruits, isn't he, of our resurrection. God has 
provided a saviour who rose again from the dead on the third day. He is fulfilling what that was looking at. The festival of weeks, or Pentecost, of course, is all about harvest. The church grows, doesn't it? really starts on the day of Pentecost with the day of harvesting of souls. 3,000 men were counted, no mind women and children. So there are thousands coming into the church on that day. And then the festival of trumpets. Hard one to work out how that is fulfilled by Jesus. We think it's fulfilled in the second coming. That's where it seems to be fulfilled. Day of atonement. Well, that's an easy one. Jesus Christ is the sacrifice again for our sins. Romans 3.23, propitiation has been made. The wrath of God has been turned away by the death of Jesus. His wrath was poured on Jesus instead of on us. On the Day of Atonement, that high priest went into the Holy of Holies with trepidation because if that uh, lamb was not perfect, the priest would die. And then the last one is the Tabernacle Festival of Tabernacle or the uh, Feast of Booths. Again, John chapter 1. Jesus, the Word. Jesus, or the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But that word dwelt literally is tabernacled among us. We would say today, if there was such a word, tented among us we don't have tabernacles we have tents to me or yurts or whatever they are um but he tented with us he tabernacled with us that's what john is saying he, he's the word became flesh god the son has put flesh on and he's dwelling among us he's living among us and of course one day we will <coughs> excuse me be living with him in eternity so of course these feasts and festivals were held all the time and so Jesus fulfills them and does away the need for them. Now we can look at them and we can study them and we can learn things about what God is like, what we are like, what the Israelites did. But what we're, all we're doing is we're seeing what, something that Jesus has clearly fulfilled. The ritual sacrifices are all fulfilled by Jesus and his death on the cross. Because those sacrifices that were made in the book of Leviticus and in the wilderness and then in the temple, they're all temporary. They're all pointing forward because they keep having to be made. But when Jesus cries, it is finished, all the grain offerings, peace offerings, burnt offerings, purification offerings, restitution offerings, they were finished by the death of Jesus. He fulfilled them all. All the mess, all the blood, gone because the blood of Jesus has been spilt for us you see the big sins that needed a big sacrifice well one sacrifice has come we don't live in a day now where we need one sacrifice for this sin and a different sacrifice for a sin of omission or anything else and the difficulty is of course how do you get assurance is my pigeon good enough for God because that's all I can afford is that bull going to be enough for what I've done? All those different sacrifices, do they bring assurance? As the priest, has he been forgiven of his sins? And so the priests go forward into the presence of God. They go forward with fear and trepidation. And as we mentioned last week, we come to before the throne of God with boldness, with assurance. We come to the Holy of Holies because the way has been opened up. The curtain in the temple has been torn in two from top to bottom. We can now go into the presence and have access to the presence of the living God because we go in the blood and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't worry about whether we can afford to make a sacrifice. We don't have to make a sacrifice ourselves. I mentioned earlier, the animal had to be yours so that you were making a kind of a financial sacrifice. Kind of one of your assets is being, I was going to say stripped, but it's being killed. But we don't make sacrifice. We don't, it doesn't cost us anything because it costs Christ everything. 
And we see really justice, the justice of God at the cross, don't we? How serious sin is to God. How serious even his own son does not escape his wrath. His wrath being poured out upon the sinless saviour for our sin. But of course at the cross we see grace. God willingly supplying the sacrifice for us. God has done it. God has come. God the Son has put on flesh so that you and I can be forgiven our sins for all that he has done. Do you notice how oft we read a few times the phrase, a pleasing aroma to the Lord? It's a nice thing to hear if you're a Israelite, isn't it? That when the smell goes up, the offering goes up, the smell pleases the Lord. Relax a bit. A fragrant offering. Well, they do please the Lord so much that in Numbers 1 1, Moses is in the tent. But it's nothing to compare, is it, with how pleased God the Father is with God the Son. In him I am well pleased. Philippians 2 reminds us there's a day coming when every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord of all. He is the King of kings. And he will be given the name which is above every name. And so tonight, you and I can commune with God. We can know the presence of God because of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We can come because his blood has been shed. We can know the presence of a holy God by his Spirit, despite the fact that we're sinners, because Jesus has become our ritual sacrifice. He does it willingly he does it having prevailed, and he does it having fulfilled it all. What difference does Jesus make? All the difference in the world to us, doesn't he? We don't have to worry about blood being splattered everywhere. We don't have to worry about all those things because the blood of Christ has been shed for us. And so we come with assurance and boldness to pray to him. Good, well, we're going to sing before we come to pray. Uh, we're going to sing, oh, my favourite hymn. And I didn't choose the songs, uh, but it's my favourite hymn. Tis finished, the Messiah dies, cut off for sins, but not his own. Accomplished is the sacrifice, the great redeeming work is done. Let's sing to God's praise. <laughs>
close this part of the meeting in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you as well that in him we have the right to claim our heaven because Christ has died for us to bring us to you. So thank you for your word. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. Pray your blessing upon us now in his name. Amen.